Um, all right, well, today is, uh, is my uh, last opportunity to sort of bludgeon you with the uh, importance of uh, ethics and journalism, uh, so bear with me. Um, I, uh, I want to conclude uh, the discussion we had the other day about uh, personal conduct, although that sort of will lace throughout this uh, uh, talk today. Um, let me just start by saying something that I did say earlier in the course, but just to repeat for emphasis, which is that the requirements of journal journalistic ethics do not require journalists to be saints. Um, it is not a matter of perfection that's required. It, it is a profession that encourages uh, skepticism, a willingness to challenge authority, a willingness to question orthodoxy. Um, a lot of journalists are aggressive and bullheaded, um, relentless. Uh, a lot of the things that make great journalists do not always make nice people, frankly. Um, uh, what, are, what is required of journalists, uh, I believe, uh, in order to to behave responsibly, professionally, and ultimately ethically are two real things, which are honesty and dedication to principle. Um, in, on the subject of honesty, the one thing that is really, frankly, intolerable in journalism is fakery, um, is making things up. Uh, we saw it with Jason Blair. We, saw, we talked about Janet Cook, who made up the heroin victim uh, years ago. Uh, Eric Slater at our own paper. In fact, there was a really sad incident uh, at the Los Angeles Times a few years ago of a photographer um, who was in Iraq um, and who manipulated some images in a photograph. The, the manipulation, actually, I didn't even notice it, but, um, but a number of readers noticed it. Um, and while it would, didn't fundamentally change the image, it was an act of deception. Um, and he, didn't, he was not a habitual faker. He had, didn't have any career of this. He was under the worst uh, possible imaginable stress, really, in the middle of the war, bless you. Um, but he was fired. Uh, he was fired. Uh, he brought back from the from Iraq to the United States and fired. Um, and that is just, I think, testament to the degree, the the absolute importance that is placed on honesty, the honesty between readers uh, and journalists. Um, too much uh, depends on that integrity, on that um, expectation of honesty, to allow any dishonesty to creep into it. Um, you read, uh, I hope. Um, this USA Today case involving Jack Kelly, um, somewhat less well known than Janet Cook or Jason Blair, um, but, but with some of the same real uh, significant issues. It's an absolutely horrid uh, misuse of anonymous sources uh, that's documented here um, in the Kelly case. Um, it, he used anonymity not to get information or to protect people from harm, uh, but to deceive. Um, he made things up um, and used uh, anonymous sources to try to get away with it and did for a long time. What's really, uh, to me, quite startling about the USA Today episode, and I mentioned this the other day, um, is not so much that a, um, you know, a fundamentally deceitful reporter could con a lot of people for a long time, but what's really scary about this episode is the number of people who suspected that something was amiss, um, and yet nothing happened. Um, there's a, a line on page nine of the report, um, which was co-written, by the way, by a former boss of mine, um, uh, that, says, that talks about um, the, fear, the fear factor uh, in the newsroom. And what I thought was really, it's interesting, um, they talk about how they, they the, the three uh, sort of senior journalists who investigated uh, these allegations, um, that they really came to this with some skepticism. You go into any newsroom in America, and I guarantee you, you will find plenty of bad morale. I mean, it is just an endemic to the business. It is a, it's a cranky bunch of people. Um, uh, and so I suspect, like I would, if I were in their instance, they came in wondering whether they really should believe that there was this sort of pervasive fear that affected the journalism of the place. Uh, but I love this quote. Um, from the, uh, from the, they quote different staff members, and it says, the culture here tells you every day that you give your superior what he or she wants in order to look good. Um, that is a really dangerous place for a newsroom to get, where, where you're no longer engaged in a really spirited debate or dialogue um, about what it is you're trying to report, and instead you're trying to please superiors. Um, I they also refer to the news department as the house of mean, um, which I think is just lovely. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's a reminder, though, that, that honesty exists in a certain kind of uh, environment, an environment where people feel that they can tell the truth, where they can, they can spot someone who is uh, suspicious or who seems to be up to no good and tell someone and have it make a difference. Um, uh, similarly, uh, the issue of honesty, I think, uh, creeps into the other uh, two things I had you read uh, for this week. Um, the piece about this guy, uh, what was his first name? Wolf. Um, uh, Richard Wolf, um, uh, formerly of Newsweek, uh, who, there, who has a new book out, which I have not read, uh, but with the accusation, and I, I don't know whether it's true or not, but the accusation is that he let his access, the fact that he had such access to Obama, 
uh, ultimately cloud his reporting and make him sort of too favorable to Obama. That and now people are looking back over the Newsweek coverage of the campaign and wondering whether that not only the book is is sort of uh, unbalanced with respect to Obama, but whether it sort of bled back into the Newsweek coverage. That is not an uncommon problem, and I don't know whether Wolf is guilty of it or not, but it's not an uncommon problem or an uncommon uh, accusation that that access uh, taints um, the ability to be completely honest, that you, uh, for a variety of reasons, the worst being that you know, explicitly get access in return for writing positively, but the much more common and uh, insidious uh, version of this is that you get to like people who you spend a lot of time with often, especially people like Barack Obama, people who are professional politicians. They're good at appealing to people. They understand, they, they communicate well. You spend a lot of time with someone like that. You're bound to like them. Uh, or you're not bound to like them, but you're likely to like them. Um, and uh, that's something that uh, a, an honest, a sort of self-critical journalist <laughs> needs to guard against. Um, there's the other uh, piece of reading uh, for this week, uh, talked about opposition research. Uh, and that's another way, I think, in which journalists need to be really scru scrupulous about their honesty. It is really tempting when someone brings uh, a journalist a piece of very damaging information um, to just be exultant about it. I mean, it's a, often good stories come through opposition research. But you also have to be mindful of the motives of the people uh, that you're dealing with. And there are times where uh, opposition research either isn't accurate or isn't well checked. Um, and because reporters are, are lazy, um, they end up printing things that are either half true, not true, or with missing part of the story, which is the fact that the other side uh, is the source of the information. Um, so uh, I would just sort of conclude this uh, little section by saying, honesty in the case of journalism, in the case of a journalistic ethic, is not merely an unwillingness to lie. Uh, it is an affirmative duty to tell the truth. Um, and, and that's regardless of who's made uncomfortable uh, by that. There is always the risk of alienating sources, of, um, of offending your employer, believe me, um, of angering friends. Um, it, nevertheless, that, the commitment to honesty in journalism has to mean something more than just being silent in the face of deception or of a lie. It means an affirmative duty to tell that. And that, that bleeds a little bit into the second half of what I would put as the sort of big two on uh, journalistic uh, the requirements of uh, integrity in journalism, and that is a dedication to principle. Uh, but as we've talked about throughout this course, the uh, accepting a, the responsibilities of journalism means uh, being willing to forego privileges that are available to others. Um, some of these are very obvious. You know, this you can't, you're covering the, the presidential campaign, you can't have a McCain sticker on your car or sign in front of your house. Um, if you're an environmental reporter, you're not going to be joining the Sierra Club or, you know, uh, participating in environmental affairs in that way. This is the Linda Greenhouse question is, did she get over that line? Um, and as we've talked about a lot, uh, obviously an extremely talented reporter, but someone who really did uh, push that line when she marched in that rally and then later with that talk. That, by the way, is most dicey for journalists as they rise up the ladder of news organizations. Um, the editor of the Los Angeles Times supervises environmental coverage, political coverage, uh, community coverage. So more and more areas of what we would consider sort of civic life become off limits uh, to people as they become responsible for more coverage. Um, that uh, is a duty nevertheless. I, I had a long talk with the then editor of the Los Angeles Times years ago, uh, and we, I alluded to it earlier, about whether reporters should be allowed to register to vote. Um, from his perspective, uh, that created real problems. Ultimately, we decided that was going too far. Um, but you know, he's someone who had to. Super, he's not someone who had the liberty of saying, "Well, I'm not an environmental reporter, so I could join the Sierra Club. Uh, I'm a political reporter, so I won't put out an Obama sign." Because he had responsibility for this whole organization, he really saw it in the biggest possible terms. Um, nevertheless, I think that any position in journalism uh, uh, imposes a certain kind of duty of dedication. It. It provides, journalism provides a platform for those who work in it that is not available to most people. Um, I am here today to talk to all of you because I've spent a life in journalism. That is an opportunity uh, that I would not have had I not uh, devoted my professional life to journalism. I have the ability to write an editorial that goes out to a million people uh, on a Sunday. Um, that's a, uh, that's an, a platform that is not available to most people in the society. And with it come commensurate uh, responsibilities and duties. Um, let me talk about one little caveat uh, to all of this. Um, 
that may or may not be a caveat, depending on how you look at it, and that is the requirement of compassion. Um, we've talked about it in different ways in this course, but I wanted to, to bring it back sort of in this final lecture to talk about it again, um, because it, it's a difficult one. Um, some of you uh, will have read, uh, I passed around earlier links that one of you in fact provided to me, um, of the Haiti coverage um, immediately after the earthquake. And this question of whether it was uh, incumbent on those reporters who were there in Haiti to help people. Um, and actually, let me just pause there and see, I don't know how many of you had a chance to look at those links or talk about or read them, uh, but what do people, I mean, what is your reaction to the question of, and let, let me pose it a little more specifically. There is, a, specifically, for instance, a CNN reporter, and I, I always forget his name, but he's the medical reporter there, uh, Dr. Blah, Blah, Blah. <laughs> That's the one, yeah, right. Um, he's a doctor, right? So he's there in Haiti. People are suffering. Um, he's there with a the camera. He's there as a journalist. He hasn't been sent there as a doctor, but he's there. He's there. Should he, you know, if he comes upon a person who's hurt in the street and he can help, should he? What do people think? Yeah, Tom. I think it's not a, <clears throat> a journalistic obligation, but almost, you know, a human responsibility. Mm -hmm. I just think that, you know, you should, in general, you know, help. as a humanitarian, if you're, in, if you're in the region for that cause and there's a great tragedy happening, you should, but I don't think it has anything to do with the journalism. I think it's just because you're there in that situation mm -hmm. as a journalist. I mean, that's what got you there. Right. You know, you should be able to, you should try to help people. Right. Yeah. I don't see why it's really a big problem. It, it can still create a story. Just because you're changing it a little bit doesn't mean that well, I'll, I'll cite an example that may challenge that a little bit in a moment, but you're absolutely right. And certainly in most instances, you wouldn't expect that you couldn't do a story if you, st I mean, Lord knows there's plenty of broken legs in Haiti right now. If you help one person with one broken leg, it doesn't fundamentally change the overall story of Haiti. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think that this isn't a problem at all because it's not like, it's not like <coughs> supporting a certain candidate where there are two sides and biases. Right. This is, this is simply this person need, is in need of help and I'm in a position to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a good point. There's no, right, there's no question of bias, no question of taint. Yes, on the back. Um, I was wondering, was wondering what's the argument against it? Well, a, uh, let me, I, or that's actually a good uh, segue to this. Uh, let me read you a quote. Um, there was a photographer uh, covering, um, you may have seen this in the reading, but uh, covering the Civil Rights March in Selma. Um, and there were children who were being uh, attacked by police uh, in it. And he stopped uh, taking pictures and to help some of the children. And none other than Martin Luther King later confronted him and said, the world doesn't know that this happened because you didn't photograph it. You may be able to help one person, but you may sacrifice the ability to help all of those people by showing what's happening. Um, that's probably less true in a natural disaster situation than it is in a civil rights context, but it is to some degree true. If, if the CNN doctor misses compelling images and misses the ability to tell a compelling story, because he's put down the camera to do this personally, you know, commendable thing, then there's this kind of moral calculus there that kicks in about whether he's done a small good thing and hurt a larger good thing. Yeah. I just think there's plenty of reporters that already, they need help more than just one more story. Well, right, that assumes that in the case of Haiti, you're right, there's many reporters there. That may not be true in every instance. Now, there's a, a famous episode um, that we alluded to earlier uh, where Ed Bradley of uh, 60 Minutes is filming some people coming up on a beach and there's someone struggling and seemingly about to drown. He goes into the surf and help that person. There's not a lot of other reporters to chronicle that moment. As far as I know, I think it's just him there. So that kind of frames it in the, in the kind of maximum terms. If that person's going to die if he doesn't do anything, it's very hard to imagine that you should stand there and watch the person die because that's a great image. I mean, I certainly am not going <laughs> to argue that. Uh, but. Um, but there is, there's not always another reporter to do the journalism while you go do the commendable personal thing. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we another one? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I just want to say, I think it's uh, even somewhat more amazing when they risk their own lives just to get an image that doesn't really have to do with people like the 9-11 reporters who are like right there trying to get as close as possible while the buildings are falling down. Yeah. I think that's well, and there's a lot of that in, in wartime journalism, too. I mean, a lot of, a lot of journalists have died uh, over the years in an effort to get close enough to tell a compelling story. <coughs> yes? With the guy drowning, I mean, that's not really what I consider, like, a newsworthy story. It doesn't affect anybody else. It's just a person dying for him to, like, what would be the point of him taking a picture of that? I, 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 I think, 
Yeah, no, it's a good point. Uh, I, I believe, though, that it was part of a larger story on uh, like boat people, or it was about the dangers of this, you know, this people who he's reporting on. So, in a, in theory, and listen, again, I'm not trying to argue this case, but if you're writing about the, or reporting about the danger that these people are undergoing by having to emigrate or to, you know, wash up on beaches and boats, and one of them die, well, then you've shown it's dangerous. To stand there and let it happen is a pretty big moral price to pay to make that point. <clears throat> yes. Um, like you said, I feel like the civil rights situation is a little bit different because um, being on the media was kind of their political strategy. Mm -hmm. um, but in another situation like the drying situation, um, I feel like it is important for the journalists to do whatever they can to help because they can still report on a story saying, well, we saved him. Like this was happening because we saved him. Right. And that's what they did, by the way, yeah. <clears throat> just, um, just because if how, like, what can a person watching TV do, like, watching footage of someone drowning, whereas the person who's actually there, like, mm -hmm. why yeah. have that I mean, there's another kind of theoretical argument here, um, which, uh, again, for me, doesn't hold a lot of water, but, but it's worth considering, which is that if the mission is to report on events and you go in and you start to alter those events, um, there's certainly ways you can do that that would be unethical as a journalist. So that if you, uh, I mean, it used to be common practice, for instance, for uh, reporters to ask subjects to redo an event if they miss the photograph. There's an episode that I come across in my book research involving Dwight Eisenhower where he comes back home from Europe and he kisses his wife at the airport, and they all ask him to kiss her again because they missed it. Um, and he says, no, he won't do it. Um, but, you know, so you don't, you don't want to be, it is, I, it's, I think, properly thought of as unethical to stage events. Um, you don't want to ask the person to flounder in the surf because it would be a better image for you. Um, you know, uh, that said, if, if your effect on the event is sort of incidental, uh, it's not staging, then I think it does change that calculation some. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, regarding the Martin Luther King thing, I think that in that era, King was right in that he probably should have, he, he would have been better off overall, um, you know, documenting it. But now I don't see that as much of an issue because everyone has cameras and phones on. Well, that's an interesting question. Yeah, right. Yeah, with their phone, you know, they could record, but you're not. So um, it, I think now if you're in a position to help and there's a bunch of people around, it's, it's not quite like it was back then. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just kind of playing devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. I don't think that people should not help others. I think you need to. But in situations like Katrina, where the reporters actually got there a lot before help, what's their position? Do they help people because no one else is there, or do they need to get pictures to get help there? Like, what's which right. situation is better? If you're the only ones there, are you trying to get people to come help, or are you going right. to be the ones to help? Yeah, imagine you're in a situation of a... Uh, a crisis, or a, you know, whether it's a natural disaster or a human crisis, that people in the world generally don't know about. Um, you could there's a limited number of people you, could, you presumably as a journalist that you could help. Let's you know, it's a fire or an earthquake or something. Um, there's only so much I could do. I mean, you know, as a journalist to help a certain number of people. But if I got a compelling image or a compelling story out and it caused the United Nations to respond, then certainly you would have committed a greater good. Yes. What okay. position you take on the story, though, because with Katrina, with a lot of the like the reports about looting and widespread crime, which a lot of it was exaggerated and not even true, a lot of people argue that it deterred help efforts from coming in. Hmm. A lot of you know UN boats and planes that didn't even bother coming in because they were afraid they were being Too much. shot down by looters. So yeah, all of this presumes uh, accurate, good faith reporting. You're right. Uh, all of the, the whole. Uh, calculation gets fucked up if you're bad reporting things that are wrong. Uh, so assume the best here, for mo just for the sake of the argument. But you're absolutely right. Yes. So you, oh, you can go first. Either one. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And then we'll go to you, James. I was just gonna say, you just said that um, journalists have um, a platform to reach millions of people. They have a certain voice. Someone will find a journalist more credible than just someone you know. Mm -hmm. They're all shown to on YouTube. I kind of think that they do have an obligation to just to get the story first, and then they can help. Going to get more help. Uh -huh. I, uh, I generally agree with you and yet recognize that there are moments when that is a hard thing as a person to insist on. Yeah, right. Depending on you personally, you have a big ethical obligation over anything else. I also, uh, it gets a little more dicey in these cases of these reporting doctors, you know, I mean, in the sense that I, then there's a whole other set, and I don't, I'm no expert in medical ethics, but I suspect that it's difficult for a doctor who happens to be a reporter
to say, I'm just going to be a reporter today and I'll be a doctor at six, you know. Um, and so uh, that gets a little dicier. But in general, I think you're right. It's important to keep in mind what the principal mission of the journalism is, or the journalist is, um, and then recognize that there may be times where you have to throw that out the window anyway. Um, yes? <clears throat> Oh, that's an interesting point. Yeah, right. Because the fact that journalists even have to go in. And it's so bad that even journalists will help. Yeah. Right. Right. So I think it's, I mean, I know we're talking about maybe Katrina was a different example, but I think for Haiti in this case, it was showing people, wow, like there is this journalism is really important. Yeah. Um, and then there's also the fact that we have to go in and we're also going to be that's a really good point. Yes, sir. I think ethics and morals kind of can conflict because if I was in the reporters, um, you know, when the kids were getting beaten, like it would be hard to just watch the kids getting beaten and look. Let me look at the big picture when this is happening right now. So like Martin Luther King was mad, like, oh well, you're not exposing the big picture, but how how can if, if it goes against your morals, how can you watch that happen? <laughs> Well, yeah, although, you know, then that takes you into a kind of a different realm, which is, you know, the king made a decision to recruit these children uh, to do this. He wanted these children to be beaten. Um, so uh, if we're going to talk about the grand moral calculation of this, um, that gets kind of dicey, too. I mean, and yet, uh, I think his answer, uh, far, far be it for me to speak for Martin Luther King, but, um, you know, I, I think an answer to that is that it's, you, the mission of that movement was to convince people that there was a terrible moral wrong being committed on a continuing basis and to show people of good conscience how evil that had turned a whole part of American society. And what better way to show that than to show that the, the determination to, to uh, persist in one's racism would allow one to beat a child. And so I think in, from his view, from a, again, from a kind of very superstructural moral uh, calculus, that makes sense. But it does mean saying to children, I'm going to send you out in the street to get sprayed by a water can and a bit by a dog. Um, you know, in that sense, the journalistic equation is sort of subordinate to this much larger conversation about what's moral in that instance. And you're right. I think that morals, morals and ethics do not always uh, produce the same answer, but I think a good faith you know, in ethical inquiry will often lead you to a moral answer as well. I mean, there is no journalistic morality, per se. There's a journalist set of journalistic ethics, but it's based on kind of moral principles um, that sometimes get complicated. Yeah, sure. Not to be like a dick or anything, but like <laughs> Luther King, like, I mean, he assumed that people were going to be dying. I mean, they were going to be obviously burned, but like in Haiti, it's different. People are like bleeding out, you know, so it's just like death versus like an injury. Right. It's like a C, like a point. Well, right. I mean, all of these things, there's always a, a kind of misdemeanor version and a felony version, you know? Uh, and <clears throat> yeah, you don't, I mean, it is one thing to watch a kid be hit with a baton, it's another to watch him shot, you know? Uh, and so, the, one of the problems, of course, is that these things tend to happen rather quickly and they tend to be sort of chaotic when they're happening. And it's a little different, a little difficult to sort of say, I want you to stop for a second, because I'm gonna put down my camera if you're, if you're gonna shoot that kid, but if you're just gonna hit him, then I'm, I'm gonna take a picture. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a limit to how far you can parse this down, you know. Yes? <clears throat> I think today there's also usually like a journalist reporting and then like a camera guy. And so you almost have two people. So like I, I remember watching something on CNN. Mm -hmm. One of the reporters, like the camera was still rolling, but the reporter was like helping to get mm -hmm. the feed. Yeah. Well, that's why we have images of some of these reporters helping, right. in fact. You're right. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that, uh, and I think Haiti also gets changed by the fact that very quickly there were a lot of journalists there. I mean, I think the point that you raised earlier, if you're the only journalist reporting on a little known tragedy, that might change some of these, the way you sort of calibrate this, um, in that, you know, the, a lone journalist cannot solve the problems of an earthquake ravaged community but a lone journalist sending a compelling report out into the world that causes a, a response to that tragedy can really make a difference. And I do think that then 
that may change the, the, the moral or ethical answer that you reach about how much impact can you have and at what cost. Um, I think also when journalists kind of choose, um, we were saying about like the human responsibility over the journalist responsibility, it kind of um, <clears throat> allows the public to recognize the journalist more and appreciate the journalist more. I mean, like when Anderson Cooper helped the boy in Haiti, um, I don't think, it kind of made everyone appreciate, wow, like these journalists are out there, like they're not, they're really there to like help <coughs> the this cause. I don't think anyone would disagree that he should have done that. Right, no, I think you're right. Okay, we're gonna move on a little bit and we'll, we can come back to any of this. But um, one additional duty, uh, in addition to the, the dedication to principle that requires journalists to, um, to withdraw from certain parts of public life, I think is again, there's a, a sort of, that, if that's the sort of negative duty, there's also this affirmative duty. Um, and that is that journalists have a special obligation to monitor themselves, um, not just personally, but their colleagues, um, their organizations. Uh, you'll. I didn't bring them with me today, but if you look back at the LA Times guidelines, the ethics guidelines, the introduction talks about um, the special duty and the special difficulty to uh, sound off when you see something going wrong in a news organization. That's, that's the duty that I think that um, USA Today journalists, some tried uh, to fulfill that duty to no avail. Um, uh, and it is a duty, by the way, that I should say that I'm most proud of my colleagues uh, at the LA Times for fulfilling uh, in that Staples episode. Um, you'll recall Henry, uh, when he came, talked about you know, his, this idea that he feels a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a, a limit to his loyalty uh, to the organization. And, and yet, that that, um, that willingness to challenge the organization, um, to speak out in the face of bad acts by the organization, in the end, I think, is a loyalty to the organization itself, although people <laughs> at the organization may not see it that way. Um, but uh, certainly, it is a loyalty to the principles that we've been talking about throughout this course, that um, their, their loyalty to journalism and to expression, um, uh, to uncovering and reporting the truth, exceeds that, that any duty to colleagues, to your employer, uh, to, um, to institutions. Um, I would just say as a principle uh, to sort of guide ethics in this area, that for journalists, those who help uncover the truth and help report it deserve the loyalty of other journalists. And that those who inhibit that or deceive or uh, act against those principles deserve special scrutiny and exposure. Uh, and that is true whether the person doing that is the chief of police or the mayor or the president uh, or the publisher uh, or the owner uh, of the newspaper. Um, merely being affiliated with a newspaper should not make people <coughs> immune uh, from this kind of scrutiny. And journalists who work at news organizations have a duty to expose those people too. And as I say, uh, I, I think the USA Today report is sad uh, in the sense that you realize the number of people who tried to say something and got nowhere with it. By contrast, I think um, the experience at the LA Times uh, over Staples provides the opposite lesson, which is that people did speak out and it did have an effect. In fact, it had the effect really ultimately uh, of toppling the management of the paper, which was something to see. Um, uh, so let me ask the, the sort of uh, rhetorical question, why does any of this matter other than for, you know, providing rules for journalists themselves uh, to think about and talk about? Um, and I would offer a couple of thoughts on that. Uh, first of all, journalism is not static. Uh, it is an animate process. Um, journalism comes to life in the moment that a reporter discovers something new. Um, and then you know rushes to a keyboard or a BlackBerry or a, or a camera or wherever and and <coughs> tells the story of this new piece of information. Um, that means that it is because it's not static. It's not inert. It is the process of this animate, the, the result of this animate process. Uh, it's a human process, um, and therefore it is sub subject to all the failings that all of us are subject to. Uh, to greed, to bias, to misunderstanding, um, to deceit. Because that, that and that wouldn't matter if it were just if it were just an animate process and it was subject to to all those kinds of problems. Well, big deal. It's sort of off to the side. But it does matter because journalism is also important. Um, it, it is impossible to imagine uh, our world without journalism and the role it's played in creating the world that we live in. 
If you try to imagine, uh, I don't know how many of you know the history of this state, but try to imagine the story of the Dust Bowl or the history of California without the photographs of Dorothea Lange, who, who portrayed uh, these you know, tr uh, tr sort of tragic figures in that, uh, in that period. Imagine uh, what the country we would be without the writing of Upton Sinclair and the muckrakers. Imagine the implications that's had for food safety, for worker safety. Um, uh, without the, or imagine the country without the sort of analysis or prose of, of, of various analysts. James Reston happens to be my favorite. Um, I happened to come upon a quote of his uh, the other day when I was doing some research on uh, the Eisenhower years. Eisenhower had a heart attack in 55, and on the next day, um, uh, Reston wrote this, few men in the public life of the republic have yielded such power and yet retained such affection. Um, I'm here to tell you after five years of researching Dwight Eisenhower that no sentence captures his presidency better than that. Um, that matters to us as a society that people are doing this work. I mean this goes back to Thomas Paine, to Ben Franklin. This, these are uh, foundational notions of who we are. And who we are and the way we are organized as a society is in large measure a product of the journalism that has brought us there. Because that journalism is so important and because it is subject to all these human failings, um, it deserves and largely receives a huge amount of protection, um, both officially, I mean, uh, both constitutionally and statutorily and in all kinds of other ways. Um, it is why we have a First Amendment. It's also why it's the First Amendment. Um, <clears throat> it is no accident that expression and press are protected at the very outset of the Bill of Rights. They rank with the religious freedom in this country as things that we depend on. It's also why we have all these other kind of supportive laws around journalism. The Shield Laws, the Public Records Acts, the Freedom of Information Act, the Open Meetings Rules, the, the libel rules that we talked about in New York Times versus Sullivan. Um, just to single one of those out, and I'm not going to go back to the New York Times versus Sullivan again because we talked about it a lot, but think about what a shield law does. Um, a shield law deliberately thwarts law enforcement. Um, it says that there are certain conversations that, that, that prosecutors may not find out about. Um, and even though finding out about those conversations might help them put people in jail. Um, Shield laws, are, those are not the only laws that, that sort of circumscribe the work of prosecutors. You know, we, when, if you talk to your doctor, that's a protected conversation. Your doctor cannot be asked to, or can be asked, but is not required uh, to tell about it. In fact, ethically is not allowed to talk about a, something that is subject to patient, doctor-patient confidentiality. Similarly, you talk to your psychiatrist. Uh, you talk to your spouse. Um, these are conversations that, that we have recognized are off limits to prosecutors. There was a moment in history where the spousal privilege was almost uh, abolished, but it wasn't. Um, and there's a reason for that. We imagine, we think, I hope we're right, uh, that we are a healthier society if you can talk to your lawyer candidly, or your doctor candidly, or your psychiatrist, or your, or your husband, or your wife. Um, because we accept that, that the privacy of those conversations makes us better people, uh, that we can be healthier and we can get better legal defense and we can have presumably better marriages. Um, it's, I submit to you that the conversations between reporters and anonymous sources have done at least as much to make this a better country as the conversations between doctors and patients or lawyers and clients or husbands and wives. Um, that the ability to have those conversations has revealed essential truths about our government and our society that we would not know otherwise. Um, and, and that's why the, the shield laws, some, some states have them, some don't, and that's more complicated, but um, that's why, to my mind, they serve an ethical purpose. Um, they, and they serve it for precisely the reasons I'm describing, that, that we recognize that the journalism is important, and we recognize that it needs protection because it is so important. In the end, though, uh, journalists have to stand for themselves. Um, there's only so much protection that we can or should ask for from the government. Um, that there's nothing the government can do to protect journalism against sloppy reporting or bias, um, greed. Um, there, there are plenty of failings that journalists can succumb to that no First Amendment, no shield law, uh, no Public Records Act can prevent. So the foundation for journalistic ethics cannot be found in the government or even in the Constitution. It has to be found within journalism itself. And it has to be safeguarded by journalists first 
not government officials. <clears throat> Uh, so why bother uh, with all of this? Uh, let me tick off a few reasons why I think it's worth uh, bothering. Um, journalism makes us a better people. <clears throat> it, in big ways and little ways. Um, start with some of the littler ones. It provides guidance uh, for consumers. Um, we watched uh, those uh, NBC investigations about the food safety at the, at the farmer's market or at the, the grocery market. Um, you watch that story, you can make informed decisions about where you want to eat, um, about whether you're in danger of getting sick. If you read the Los Angeles Times or other newspapers' coverage about Toyota, um, you might reach different conclusions. Some people are undoubtedly are reading those stories and saying, you know, for the number of Toyotas they made, this doesn't seem like a lot of accidents. And they might decide this might be a good time to buy a Toyota because you can probably get one cheap. Or you might uh, read those same stories and say, you know what, that risk is too much risk. Uh, for me to put myself or my family or my friends through, I'm going to buy a Chevy. Um, that's a decision that you can make either way you choose to make it, but the coverage of this as a consumer issue informs that decision in a way that you would not have the ability to do if you didn't have the coverage. On a really uh, sort of small but daily life basis, movie reviews, restaurant reviews, um, they give you information. You've got a certain amount of money and a certain amount of time. You want to spend it well, presumably. Um, Journalism, through its, through its reviews, provides you with, with help to do that. It lets you lead an easier, more productive, more thoughtful life. It is, uh, journalism supplies history uh, for scholars. <coughs> it's a huge part of my work and that part of my life. I had the opportunity recently to read uh, the McCarthy hearings. McCarthy hearings um, were televised beginning in, I should know the answer to this, but I think it's like April or May of uh, 1954. The New York Times ran a complete transcript of those hearings every day. Um, it is an extraordinary historical document. Um, it, it, the, I, and other uh, times in life, I had the opportunity to go back and read the editorials after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, uh, or after the or after Brown versus Board of Education uh, was handed down by the court in '54, or uh, during, before, during, and after the internment of the Japanese on the West Coast uh, during the Second World War. Those uh, editorials, those, that coverage, provides real insight into the people that we are. Um, it, show, it captures uh, the sense of the country as it has passed through uh, this continuing self-examination, this continuing effort to, to perfect this union. Um, journalism captures that in a way that no other institution can. Um, and that goes back to the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers, which are a, a document that we use to interpret the Constitution today um, were written as serialized journalism. Now, they were written by James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. They were pretty top-end journalists. Um, but, you know, the fact is these were not done as historical reflections, um, you know, 20, 30 years later. These were contemporary attempts to write the journalistic history of the deliberations that produced the Constitution. That notion, analytical journalism, has been with us since before we were a country, um, and it has helped define the country that we are today. Journalism also supplies literary gifts, um, to gifted readers anyway. Um, you read J.R. Moringer's uh, Pulitzer Prize winning story about G's Bend in Alabama, or Barry Birak and the heroin story that I quoted to you uh, early in this course, or a reporter, now late, uh, sadly, Bella Stumbo, writing about Marion Barry, uh, then the mayor of Washington. These are works of profound literary quality um, that they, they provide the, a foundation for a literary and writing culture. Um, that is not a small thing. This, yes, there's book writing, there's magazine writing, there's all kinds of writing, all of it uh, interesting and different. Um, but, there, but that ability to, to chronicle the life of a country or the life of a community um, in sophisticated literary terms is also part of our journalistic history. Journalism supplies entertainment, um, profiles, coverage of sports, um, even celebrity coverage has a certain value. We live in a, in a, a tense and difficult world in many respects, and Enter there's nothing wrong with entertainment. Um, the Olympics, uh, for those of you who follow the Olympics, follow the, journal the coverage of the Olympics, um, is ennobling in, in real ways. I mean, you can be a sports fan or not, but there's value to it. Entertainment matters. Um, but then finally, and most important, uh, 
journalism is the foundation of a free society. <clears throat> there is no genuinely free society without a free journalistic enterprise, whether that's newspapers or TV or radio. I mean, well, there's no accident that in every coup, it's, you always get the radio station first, right? Um, <clears throat> There cannot be democracy without knowledge of who we are and how our government works. Um, you cannot uh, responsibly vote for a mayor or a school board member or a city council member or even a president if you don't have some sense of what that person stands for and who that person is. Now, different people will extract different messages from that coverage. You know, some people will hate Bill Clinton till the day he dies because of his relationship with Monica Lewinsky. Uh, and some people will see him as having been persecuted by a vast right-wing conspiracy, to quote uh, his wife. Um, you can agree, disagree. Was it a vast right-wing conspiracy? Was he an idiot? Maybe both. Um, the point is, you have to know. And, and there's a tendency, I think, to see the press in, in itself as intrusive. And it can be. I'm not defending every act of journalism here. Um, but, but fundamentally, it is far worse to have a press that doesn't ask and doesn't report than it is to have one that tells you too much. Because at least it gives you the authority to decide what you don't care about. Um, if you don't know about Monica Lewinsky, you can't decide whether you care that Bill Clinton had a relationship with Monica Lewinsky. Um, if you do, you can decide you don't give a shit. Uh, and that's your prerogative. But journalism, you, you, the journalists in your society owe it to you to, to have the information to make up your own mind. The government that is not watched is government not worth having. Um, and, you know, that is true at every level, that you do not want to live in a society where you send your kids to schools where the school board doesn't have anyone watching them. Um, not because they'll always do a bad thing, but because they might. And because you don't want to tempt people to do those bad things by ignoring them. We are, in the end, a public people. Um, <clears throat> you know, the original juries uh, in this country uh, would sit in front of their whole town, their names were known to their neighbors, uh, they heard evidence, uh, they passed verdicts, and then they went home and defended what they did to their neighbors um, and their family and their friends. The reason for that is that we accept as a people, we don't always accept it in every instance, but as a principle, we accept the notion that people who are watched are people who are accountable. And it is good that they have to answer for what they do. Um, now, there's a whole debate in the law enforcement life of this country of whether we should have more anonymous juries or whether we should televise trials. I was on a panel with uh, Chris Darden, who was one of the prosecutors in the O.J. Simpson case a few weeks ago. Um, and it's Chris's view, which I just absolutely, frankly, disagree with, uh, that the Simpson case sort of went off the rails because it was televised. Um, uh, my view is that every trial that can be should be televised because the because a, a trial is a public act. It is a moment where we hold someone accountable to their neighbors, to their to people who know them. And the jurors who sit on those cases should be public as well. They should be known so that they will render a better verdict. Um, we are generally better when we are watched. Um, and journalism is the vehicle by which we watch. <clears throat> um, there's a, much talk uh, in the world of journalism today, and we've, we've touched on it a little bit here already, um, about changes in technology um, and how they affect the business of journalism. And they have affected it enormously. You know, there was a time when uh, the New York Times would not run TV listings uh, in the paper because it saw TV as a threat. Eventually, TV and, and newspapers came to sort of accommodate one another. Um, um, you know, and I think different media have demonstrated the ability to do different things well. There's really nothing that compares with a newspaper for depth of coverage, for analysis, uh, for serious analysis of issues and questions in society. Uh, but there's very little that compares with TV for uh, emotional impact and imagery. Um, those images out of Haiti that we were talking about earlier. It is hard to imagine that newspaper coverage could have fully given a sense of how awful what happened in Haiti was. Same with Katrina. Um, and yet, if you want analysis of the health care bill, you're probably not going to find it on TV. Um, radio provides a whole different set of stimulus. There's something very uh, moving, as 
particularly for those of, uh, the, or those of us who are old enough to have appreciated it uh, in its day, uh, there is a kind of um, uh, majesty to it. There's a quietude to it. Uh, there's an isolation about it. There's something about listening to a radio broadcast that is different. It's one of the reasons that people fall in love with NPR. Um, and the internet provides a whole new set of ways uh, to communicate. There is no rival, at least today, uh, to the internet for immediacy or for interaction. I mean, as all of you know, you can, you can have an opinion on any damn thing on earth and you can express it on the internet while you're sitting here in class. Um, you probably shouldn't, but um, it, there's nothing like that. Um, but each of those things has its strengths and has its weaknesses. What I would say about it is for those who think that those have changed the fundamentals of journalism, I really question that. Um, I do not think that there is a separate set of ethics for TV, radio, print, and web journalism. That in the end, journalism is no different than it's always been, which is a, it's about journalists getting information and telling people about it. And whether you tell them on the radio or in front of a camera or in print or on your Facebook page, it's fundamentally the same act governed by the same ethics, uh, the same commitment to honesty, um, the same dedication to principle, the same willingness uh, to forego certain kinds of entanglements in order to have the privilege of engaging in journalism, and the same absolute uh, relentless commitment to ferreting out the truth. Um, that journalism and those principles only exist if journalists insist on them. The government will not make you do that, uh, and it can't, and it shouldn't. Um, it's important for journalists to take those principles seriously, for journalism, absolutely, but it's also important to take them seriously for society. There is no democracy if people don't do this. Um, whether they do it on the internet or they do it as a blogger or they do it as a newspaper reporter is, to my mind, again, sort of incidental. If nobody does it, the country and our, really our foundational notion of what it is to be free is what gives way. Um, and so that actually brings me uh, to the conclusion of uh, my material for you on this course. Um, I, uh, we will meet again on Tuesday and I'm happy to, uh, we'll talk about whatever you want on Tuesday, whether it's the, the final or, or any of these issues that we've gone over. Um, so I won't uh, say goodbye to all of you yet because we have another week. Um, but in the meantime, uh, that's, as I say, that's sort of uh, where I begin and end on the question of journalistic ethics. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you have. We're running a little ahead of schedule today. Yes? Um, a lot of people are sort of talking about how, you know, <coughs> the internet, and there's all these new mediums like you're talking about, and it's going to be the demise of things like these established news organizations. Um, and what's your opinion on that? Well, I hope not, <laughs> for all obvious reasons. Um, uh, listen, it has, um, more people read the Los Angeles Times today than at any point in the history of the Los Angeles Times. Um, I read somewhere, I saw a message that trafficked yesterday that there were 15, 50, maybe it was 19 million hits on the metro part of our website alone in February. Um, tens of millions of people are reading coverage in the LA Times. The problem is that only about 700,000 to a million of them are paying for it. Um, and so I, I would counter to those who think that journalism is in jeopardy. I would say that there is every reason to believe that, that people in this society today want more journalism than ever. Um, what's in jeopardy is the business model of journalism. Um, and somebody's got to figure out how to pay me to do this, you know, because I'm not going to do it for free. Um, and nor, you wouldn't want me to do it for free because uh, the fact is people who do things for free generally don't spend as much time at it and don't get as good at it as people who do it for a living. Um, so it is, you know, that is the thing that we're all waiting for in my business right now is some kind of model. Yeah, please. Um, oh, I was going to say, I know that the New York Times is going to move to a new format um, where if you read it online, you have to know it's like <coughs> it's basically like the LA Times. You know, everyone is, is toying with the model right now. I mean, because it's fairly, um, you know, you see tens of millions of hits on your website. You think there's got to be somebody who's willing to pay for that, you know? I mean, listen, it was not long ago that people said that no one, you guys know this story better than I do, that people would not pay for music anymore because it was so easy to just sort of pirate it and down. And then, you know, you get iTunes comes along and people are, in fact, willing to pay for it if you make it easy for them to pay for it. Um, so far, there is no iTunes 
app model for newspapers. Um, and is it going to be you know, a nickel to read a story by Tom Friedman and 20 cents to read one by Maureen Dowd and 22 cents to read one by Tim Rutten? I don't know. Um, it seems hard to imagine that that's the salvation to all of this. Um, but right now is a time of great experimentation. Um, and I, I have some comment. <laughs> I'm not sure that they'll work it out in time for me to benefit by it. But I think that there will journalism, it's my belief anyway, that journalism will survive this uh, because people want it. And people are willing to pay for it. Um, whether newspapers will survive it is a different question. Um, but, but big news organizations that spend a lot of money to get news I think will survive because I think people want them. Um, and you know, whether you read it on your computer or on print is kind of trivial to me. I mean, uh, and this is, I'm sorry, I think about this all the time, so I'd probably say too much on this. But here's another thing to think about in terms of reimagining this model. If you took, um, a friend and I did this last summer, when our, it sounds like sort of a busman's holiday, but we were on vacation. We were talking about this. He's a photographer and photo editor of the paper. If you were able to take the entire LA Times readership and move it off uh, paper and move it onto a Kindle, you know, or a Kindle-like device tomorrow, if you could switch a button and move them all over and get them to pay 10 bucks a month for their Kindle subscription, the whole economic problem goes away. Uh, because the LA Times newsroom, I don't know what the exact budget is, but in round numbers, so it's probably 60 to $80 million probably for news gathering a year. You take 700,000 people and you get them to pay 10 bucks a month, we're done. Um, and because you've now eliminated all your newsprint costs, all your distribution costs, all your printing costs, you know, which is gigantically expensive. Now, you've also eliminated all those jobs, so that I'm not arguing this is a great social development. But as a journalism development, if you could make that happen, uh, you've, got, you've basically stitched it back together again. And I, it's going to be very, of course, it's essentially impossible to move all those readers off the paper and onto the Kindle or, or iPad or whatever. Um, so that's not happening. But that's, that I say it only to say that there is a horizon out there in which you could imagine this some suddenly seeming better again. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I think, I don't know, I have that. I have a Nook and I can read uh -huh. my newspaper on my Nook, which is nice. What do you pay for it? Um, I don't remember. Uh -huh. A couple, it's, couple it's bucks a month. Yeah, right. Like and I get it. The frustrating part, I think people want different options because it's frustrating to read it in that format. It's mm -hmm. really small. And yeah. I don't, I don't particularly like it. Yeah. Okay. Um. And then there's my mom who has to read it on paper and stuff like that. I think one of the solutions could be the <coughs> format. Mm -hmm. Almost it keeps people in the printing, but then you have the money coming from the Kindle or even like a newspaper type iTunes thing going online mm -hmm. to help support the print. You still have different options, I guess. The, one thing I should add to that, just in terms, and I, I assume this to be the case at all newspapers, I only really know it for the LA Times, the vast majority, like in the range of 90% of the LA Times revenue comes from the print product. So even though there's all, all the growth is on the website, um, the advertising revenue is still based on the paper. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but not the least of which is the readership on the internet is really sort of tricky because you know our advertising model is basically stores, restaurants, retailers, et cetera. I take out an ad in the paper advertising their sale. You open it up. You see that it's happening. You drive over and you buy what you want to get, right? The problem is that the people, those millions of people who read it on the internet are there in Denmark and Australia and, you know, they're all over the world. So it doesn't really do me that much good if I own a, a restaurant at Hollywood and Highland to get 15 million readers in Bangalore, you know, and you probably don't have 50 million in Bangalore, but I mean, you know, the, the readers that, that can never take advantage of my ad. So aligning the, the business strategy with the journalism strategy is what's tricky. And if, if I had the answer, uh, sad to say, I probably wouldn't be here. I'd be back at the office. But, um, you know, I mean, that's, that's the quest, is to try to get uh, an advertising model that can support those various formats that you're talking about. And no one has it yet. Yeah. <clears throat> what are the, the consequences of um, every newspaper has their own um, rules of ethics, obviously, because your rules of ethics are different than the Inquirer's rules of ethics. What, how, what, what's the, the consequences of breaking ethical rules? Like, if it's just something small? Like with well, that, that's hard to answer in the abstract because it really would depend on the person. But, I mean... I, there are some rules, I, mean, I mentioned to you earlier, faking things, faking photographs, faking news. The consequence for that in most places is being fired. 
Um, and that, you know, as I mentioned, this photographer uh, who had this uh, episode of the Times, he was a good photographer, good person, solid work. Um, I don't think, I don't think, as far as I know, no other blemish on his record. He just committed the one act that you just sort of can't tolerate. Um, um, you know, other, you know, less serious violations. I mean, if um, you know, I had a if I had a reporter who had uh, given money to a candidate and I didn't know about it and I found out about it later after he'd written some stories about the candidate. I think if that's a reporter who had done other bad things, that person might get fired. If it's a reporter who otherwise had an unblemished record and screwed up, well, you know, you tell them don't do this again, you know, and you do it again and we're going to fire you the next time or we're going to dock your pay or we're going to suspend you or, you know, there's a whole range of options available to managers in these. The main thing with guidelines like we have at the paper um, is not to lay out, you know, everything, a whole list of don'ts. It's to say, listen, you're engaged in a, in a complicated business that requires you to be above reproach. Um, recognize that you may get into things that you haven't anticipated. There may be problems, so talk to people about it. Don't be, don't be shy. If you see something going on that bothers you, tell someone about it. If you're, if you're questioning, God, you know, is it okay for me to be a member of the ACLU? Ask someone. Um, and that's really, at least within the LA Times, uh, that's the fundamental purpose of these guidelines, is to give us all a kind of common document to recognize that there are situations that are complicated. Um, and that particularly for people who are new to the paper or new to the business, um, there may be other people who asked that question before um, and can answer it. Was that something that's, that's really pressed to new reporters? Like if you, if you don't know, you know, ask your, ask your boss or? That's, uh, I, I wish I brought the guidelines with me today, but yeah, that's specifically stated in the, in the guidelines. Uh, I suspect, I hope that managers throughout the paper um, uh, make it a habit of asking people to read them and sort of making sure that they have. I certainly do. I mean, I was involved in the creation of the guidelines, so I take them probably more seriously than most people. But they are, reporters are expected to know them. Um, so managers ought to be presenting them to them. I, I assume that they are. Yeah. So I think that we still have a lot of luxury in our hiring. Um, uh, which isn't to say we don't make some bad hires. I mean, you do. It's hard to it's hard to hire journalists, especially hard to hire editors. It's hard to know who's good and who isn't. Um, uh, but um, I don't think that the te I mean, I, the the biggest change that these business questions has created is not so much whether the people we're hiring are capable, but the, it's just restricted the amount of resources we have to do hiring. Um, so we're just doing much less of it. Um, as for how people are teaching it, I don't. No, I, I didn't go to journalism school. Most people that I work with didn't study journalism per se. They worked in journalism and studied something else. Um, not all, and maybe not, maybe not even most. Maybe half. You know, I mean, I. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I mean, I would assume that any sort of you know up to the moment serious journalism school these days is teaching in these areas uh, because it's no, you know, there's no point in teaching people how to use, uh, you know a dictograph when they're filing on the web, you know. So I would assume that at some level, just for professional training alone, that people are more capable technologically. Um, and certainly, uh, it is gigantically more a part of the daily life of the newspaper than when I came there. You know, when I, my first job in journalism, and I won't, uh, <laughs> I won't do this, uh, I promise, but um, uh, my first boss, James Reston, who I quoted earlier, um, had a little Radio Shack unit that you put a phone in the top of and dialed up to file to the paper. And when he would get mad at it, he would unplug it. And it would, uh, and it would do this weird download where it would rec recreate every keystroke in the piece. So every time he you know, it would say the, T-H-A, backspace, E. And you'd have to kind of, it was a hieroglyph to try to put it back together. And he would sit there sort of fuming that the machine had let him down again. Um, I mean, it's ridiculous to imagine that today, you know. I mean, and that's, you know, it's a long time ago in your lives, but it seems like yesterday to me. Um, you know, so obviously this stuff changes. Um, and, you know, there was a time not too long before that, he used, when Scotty started his work, Scotty was his nickname, um, he filed on a typewriter. Um, so that has all, you know, young journalists come to the profession with a sophistication that older journalists don't have, and that's as it's always been. Um, What's amazing to me, and this is sort of an aside, but through all these technological changes, somehow the deadline has gotten earlier and earlier on the newspaper. Um, and I don't understand how we've gotten to be so much faster at everything else, and yet I still can't file at midnight. Um, so, you know, there are weirdnesses uh, throughout it. But I would assume that, I mean, by and large, at the newspaper today, we have a lot of young people, mostly devoted to the internet, although some across disciplines, 
who just are, have a, a sophistication with the technology, certainly I don't have, um, and it was not present at the paper even four or five years ago. I mean, it has really changed dramatically. Uh, no, I don't think so, um, and I don't think, I'm not sure that I would agree with you that it's fluff. Uh, listen, there are reporters in any group, just as there are in any group of people, um, some who are harder hitting, some who are tougher, some who are more inclined to write light stories. Um, the White House press corps has always been a difficult place to be assigned because it's, a lot of it is, is waiting for the White House to make news. It's very difficult to get access to those officials, it's, you know, and that's been true. You know, and then and there's, always, there's always two arguments about the press corps. Some who think that it's snipey and unappreciative and disrespectful of the president, and some who think that it's coddling and, and not, not inquiring deeply. And that was true, that's been true of every president I've watched covered by a White House press corps. So Republicans, Democrats, um, you know, uh, I think there are clearly moments that the White House press corps would like to have handled differently. There, I think there's no question, but in the run up to the Iraq war, that there were stories missed there, not just by the White House press corps, but by the press generally. Um, I think you know there are uh, some who think that the press corps today is sort of too friendly uh, to Obama. He's probably not one of those who thinks that. Um, he's had a rough year, um, so you know I think it's it's easy uh, to criticize that group. They're in a tough spot. It's a it's a grueling day in day out job. There's very little sort of time for reflection in it. Uh, but I think by and large the country's been well served by the White House press corps. Uh, not. Not without exception, uh, but I think it's pretty pretty good folks for the most part. Anybody else? All right. Well, listen. Uh, thank you all. Um, as I say, we still have a few more to go, uh, but it's uh, been a pleasure uh, talking to all of you. So thanks. <coughs>